Right. Welcome to the Bookworm. Uh, we're happy that you could join us on this first day of spring and that you've chosen to spend such a beautiful day inside with us. Um, you are here for Tech in China. We have with us today uh, Josh Gardner, who is the international, sorry, the senior director of international communications for JD.com or uh, Jingdong, which is China's largest e-tailer. Uh, formerly, he was at Brunswick and the American Chamber of Commerce. He's been in Beijing for eight years. Uh, Kaiser Guo, who is the Director of International Communications for Baidu. Uh, you might also know him as the host of the Seneca Podcast, the founder of the rock band Tang Dynasty, and the current guitarist for Chun Tiu, or Spring and Autumn. He's been in Beijing for 20 years. Uh, and for those of you here who um, wanted to see David Wolf, we apologize. Uh, schedule, work conflict had to hold him away from us, but his replacement is Mark Natkin who is the founder and managing director of the Beijing-based consultancy Marbridge. He has 14 years of experience in East Asia, uh, working with multinationals, uh, consulting firms, etc. A lot of different things. Your moderator today will be Eric Zhou, who very, until very recently was the tech editor for China Daily and the writer for the uh, Gawker media Kotaku. But he has since moved on to better things. Um, Hopefully, yeah, working with Xbox in China. Hopefully, sorry, um, Eric. Uh, this show. Um, I'll let you take over from here. All right, so we're here to talk about tech in China. So let's get started with what is the state of tech in China? How are things going? So we know that Google's out here, but Google's back. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? No. Yes, but can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you can hear me now. Okay, cool. Um, so we're here to talk about the state of tech in China, what's going on. Um, so we know Google's not here, Motorola has left and then come back, things are different. So what is it like in China right now? I would like to have Mark start. Great. Thank you. Um, first, I'm going to throw out a, just a few statistics just to give you a little sense of what kind of market we're looking at. Uh, for a start, right now we have about 1.29 billion mobile subscribers, so about 95% penetration. Um, about 10% of those are 4G subscribers, about 40% are 3G subscribers, and the other 50% are 2G subscribers. Um, so it's an incredibly mobile-centric market right now. Um, in terms of internet penetration, uh, about 48%, a little under 50%. Uh, that's relatively low compared to other markets like the US or Japan, where it's about 87%. Um, so a lot of room for growth there. Um, it's a highly saturated market. Again, I said, you know, we're looking at about 95%. That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, 95 out of 100 people have a mobile phone. There are other people out there with multiple SIM cards. Um, but, uh, you know, what we are seeing is that we used to see the ad of about, a net ad of about 10 million mobile subscribers a month in 2012, 2013. Uh, in 2014, that dropped down to about 4 to 5 million per month. Uh, this last month, February, it was actually flat, even. Uh, negative one million, depending on whose statistics you want to look at. Um, so what we're really looking at this point is a mobile market where it's largely, uh, you know, again, very saturated, but people increasingly moving from 2G up to 3G or 4G. Uh, you can basically look at 3G and 4G as what people should be using if they want to use mobile. Um, uh, so uh, it's a market that has been and is becoming increasingly more challenging for foreign companies. Um, and again, the reason I threw out the statistics, uh, <laughs> uh, the reason to throw out those statistics is because though that's a magic number. I mean, the population here is a magic number and you know, the mobile size is a magic number meaning that there are very few companies globally that hear that number and can't stay out of this market, or at least try to operate in this market. Um, um, so, uh, but it's a very challenging market, very difficult market. We've seen a lot of uh, foreign companies that have come into this market and subsequently left this market. Uh, Google, of course, is still here, but moved all their servers from, uh, from the search business to Hong Kong. Uh, Yahoo just closed down its office, about two to three hundred person office, uh, last week. Uh, Adobe earlier uh, this year closed down its R&D facility here. 
a uh, number of other companies are increasingly finding that they're under uh, Qualcomm or other companies are finding that they're under investigation for anti-monopoly practices. So a uh, very difficult market for foreign companies to operate in. Um, what has happened is that the market has grown to that scale and it's been difficult for foreign companies is that we've seen domestic companies that have grown enormous um, and we've also seen a very heavy consolidation, uh, meaning that these days uh, between Kaiser's company, your company, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, uh, Xiaomi, and you can maybe throw in Chihu just to keep it lively. Yeah, I know you don't want to hear it. But, um, um, for many companies, that now has become the exit strategy. Instead of pushing to an IPO, you're looking to get acquired by one of these companies and become part of its ecosystem. Um, what that has also meant is that as these companies have amassed these enormous user bases and huge war chests of cash, now increasingly they're pushing overseas um, with the size of their IPOs and also the money they're spending on overseas acquisitions, they're actually starting to gain a lot of brand recognition. Um, Chinese tech companies have been going overseas forever, um, but we had companies like IR or TCL, they just, you know, they weren't at a stage where they were really getting that much brand recognition. <coughs> now they are. Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and pass it on to the next one. Um, yeah, I was just quick, do you happen to know the, the number of smartphone users in China right now? Um, it's, it's about 500 and 520. Uh, 520 million, yeah, that was like the one stat I thought that I would, I would throw into that. Um, and 634, 635 million internet users in China. It's, it's an absolutely, you, one becomes quite numb to these enormous numbers working here. I mean, it's just, you sort of forget that we're talking twice the US population, just the internet, and internet users here in China. Uh, I, I think to, to follow on what you said about the state of things, um, we're at kind of an inflection point. I think that, that more and more there's kind of convergence. While there's divergence in, in, in terms of business competition uh, with respect to uh, the so-called international internet market, uh, excuse me, China, I think that there's a lot of convergence in terms of the technology. Uh, there's convergence in terms of some of the business models that, that are really rising up and becoming very important. And there's some in which I think I think we're going to, to, to get to that later, but in which China has taken uh, a, a powerful lead uh, we're at a moment, I think, in, in the development of technology uh, that some years from now we're going to look back on as an important inflection point uh, where I think the, the slow accretion of, not so slow, the accretion, the fast accretion of, of quantitative change is about to tip into what I would call qualitative change. And the quantitative change that I'm talking about are things like, you know, faster uh, gene sequencing, uh, being able to cram more semiconductors onto a piece of silicon and give size, um, the, the uh, processor speeds, the, the density of our, of, of our uh, internet um, uh, bandwidth, uh, things like this. These are, these are quantitative changes that are happening. Um, and uh, we don't, we, we've gotten so used to this, almost that we're, we're kind of numb to it, and, and again, we don't recognize when it, it, it's hitting a moment, a uh, tipping point, to use the sort of Malcolm Gladwell expression. Um, what is that going to be? What, what, what technologies does it involve? To me, uh, it seems fairly clear that that's happening because of artificial intelligence and big data. Uh, these are the, the twin engines that are driving um, the you know, futurity of, of, of technology. And these are going to be uh, transformative in ways that we don't understand. I'm not talking about you know being able to have Scarlett Johansson on your operating system and having you know, a, a, a deep and intimate relationship, but I'm, I'm talking about um, a real uh, profound changes to uh, the ability of, of, of technology to do so many of the things that we, uh, we do so routinely in our lives today. Um, I think that we need to understand that artificial intelligence and big data are, the, are two things that can't exist apart from one another. They, they, they are mutually interdependent, mutually dependent. Uh, that the gigantic neural networks uh, that we're building today uh, on GPU-based neural networks are worthless to us without having a lot of data to, to put through them. And likewise, all that big data is meaningless to us without really sophisticated computation systems to be able to extract insights, to be able to, 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 to make sense of, of all that data. 
So these two things are, are really kind of building upon one another uh, and building very, very quickly. And I think that we are in for some, some very major changes. We've seen uh, information technology, I, I mean, the word, the word is horribly overused now, but disrupt uh, a lot of traditional industries in the past, beginning with things like print media, beginning with, you know, of course, the newspapers, magazines, and then moving to you know, the music industry, the film industry, then to retail. Uh, we've, we've seen all of these things happen. What's next? I think it's pretty obvious that it's going to be things that are very large, uh, that, that depend on a lot of data, that have a lot of information asymmetry right now, uh, that are, I'm going to talk about information asymmetry between the consumer and the provider of the service. So things like healthcare, things like uh, uh, the insurance industry, obviously the financial sector, and then uh, distance education. These are technologies that will, in very, very short order, be uh, radically upended. Well, health care is going to be the next big thing, right? Elder care. Yeah, elder care I think is going to be huge. I mean, things like telemedicine, uh, right, absolutely. But, like, I'm, I'm cutting you off a bit. No, no, you're not. Gosh, That's you that. uh, yeah, so I was going to take a bit of a macro view and, uh, and look at where the technology sector in China was uh, 10 years ago and then where it is today. So we, we were talking just before this panel about uh, Baidu's IPO, which was just about 10 years ago. Uh, they raised uh, $128 million, uh, which meant that if you if you bought early, you made a, a huge amount of money because it's, it's now a $70 billion company, $74 billion company. Uh, if you look at the two largest, uh, the largest IPO on NASDAQ and uh, NYSE last year uh, were both Chinese tech companies. Uh, so you can see the, the, the difference that 10 years makes in terms of uh, how investors look at China, how the sector is developed, uh, where the focus is. And, and I think that you see that a lot with the, uh, the startups as well. And, and Mark was talking about um, how some of these startups are getting into different ecosystems. And uh, what's interesting to look at is the kind of valuations that they're getting now. So uh, pretty much any tech company in China that's in, in A round, B round, C round, their, their valuations are um, astronomical compared to uh, even a couple of years ago. Uh, so the, the, the potential that people see in the Chinese market uh, is, is enormous. Um, and and I, I think that, that speaks to another point uh, in terms of uh, how technology fits into people's lives in China. So uh, if, if you look at our sector, uh, e-commerce, uh, as a proportion of, uh, of GDP, e-commerce is is, is much, much larger than it is in the U.S. Uh, it's much more central to people's lives. Um, so when you're looking at different parts of everyday life, I think that it's just a natural fit that in China, uh, people migrate towards new technologies. Um, they're able to catch on more quickly. Uh, they're able to penetrate people's lives. Uh, and, and I think that's part of why you're seeing the valuations that you're seeing. Uh, obviously, it's somewhat of a somewhat frothy right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that everything's overvalued. It probably means that some of the, thing, some of the companies are overvalued. Cool. So you guys all touched on companies. Mark talked about this a bit earlier, Chinese companies heading out west. Now, one of the big things about heading out west is, can Chinese companies compete and succeed? And by heading out west, I'm not just talking about going to the established markets of the US or Europe, but what about the other markets, such as Brazil, Russia, India? South Africa. So, for, for instance, with Kaiser in particular, we have Baidu. So, how, is, how does Baidu compete to, like, say, Google in Brazil? Uh, well, the short answer is we really aren't yet. Uh, Baidu has tried to sort of find the Goldilocks markets outside of the United States, uh, outside of China, rather. Uh, so, n neither too developed nor too underdeveloped. So, we're not going into Western Europe or North America. We're not really meaningfully looking at, 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 uh, any, at, at South Korea, for example, uh, as, as a market. We had an early and unpleasant experience with Japan where we were really quite unready. Uh, it was already a very mobile market by the time we went in without a, a mature mobile internet product in 2008. Uh, and we've actually stopped supporting our search engine in Japan altogether. Uh, we're not looking at Sub-Saharan Africa too meaningfully. Um, we, we are taking a look at South Africa, but not, not other markets there. Uh, or at under uh, 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 other uh, very Really developing 
markets. We are, though, looking at the sort of mid-level markets, the ones that resemble China maybe, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago uh, in terms of their level of internet penetration, in terms of the level of, of, of internet services that are available. Um, and we think that we do stand a chance there uh, because of the relatively low levels of internet penetration. We're going to, we still, there are plenty of people who will come on, begin using the internet who have not yet pledged allegiance to Google. Google, by the way, is, is in, um, it, it's, it's the dominant search engine in every market that it is present in except for four. Those are China, of course, South Korea, where Naver really rules, Russia, where Yandex is, is, is still higher, and oddly, the Czech Republic. Right? Um, but in every other market, um, you know, they're, they're clearly the one to beat. Um, uh, I think that it, it, it can be fairly said that uh, they, while I don't think that they have a, a, an entirely one-size-fits-all approach, uh, ours is probably more uh, hyper-local. We really kind of begin anew when we go there, and, and, and from first principles, like we, we try to build it according to what we think uh, local internet usage patterns are. Uh, so what we do in Indonesia will look very, very different than what we're doing in, 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 in Brazil. So we've actually only formally launched uh, search in Brazil. Uh, we have, I mean, it's accessible now, though we're not promoting it in Egypt for North Africa and the, and the Arabic speaking Middle East. Uh, in uh, in uh, Indonesia, where we have some mobile services, and in Thailand. Uh, we will probably be looking at, an, uh, at a Spanish-speaking market of Latin America very, very soon. And uh, we will be looking at other sort of mid-level uh, development markets. I think that we are going to be very patient about this. We think that it's a very long-term thing. We don't expect overnight success, and we're not going to hightail it out with, uh, with our tail between our legs at the, at the first reversal that we experience in some of these markets. So, well, you see a lot of Chinese companies moving out recently. We have Xiaomi trying to establish a footprint in the U.S., Alibaba, etc., trying to move out there, too. So is there anything in, that in commerce, for instance, is JD moving out or looking out at the West? Yeah, so I think that we're... We're keeping our eyes and options open uh, for different markets, but at this point, we have about 100, 100 million users on an annual basis uh, in China. So that leaves us a fair amount of room to continue to grow. Uh, but I, I think what Kaiser was saying, I think, is probably right for the whole industry in terms of uh, which markets people are looking at. I, I think that. Uh, you know, certainly for e-commerce companies, a uh, market like the U.S. or Europe is going to be very hard to go into. Um, but markets in Southeast Asia, you know, possibly Brazil, uh, you know, the, the BRICS um, countries that are somewhat developed but uh, but don't have this established companies um, that are dominating the market, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and I, I, I think that when you look across you know, not just e-commerce, but across different sectors, you're seeing the same strategy. So you, you see that uh, companies like Xiaomi are targeting India. Um, uh, OnePlus is, is targeting India as well. Uh, so I think that that's going to be a theme that's fairly consistent across uh, different pieces of the, of the tech sector, which is sort of a, a, a very broad. And successful very widely by the sector that they're in. For doing, people doing pure internet services, it may be more difficult. Uh, whereas some doing, say, games like Tencent, they've had some success in game operations abroad, uh, or doing you know, hardware like Xiaomi is. Uh, uh, Xiaomi's doing splendidly. I mean, they, they haven't just targeted India, they've basically won it, and won it in, in a matter of weeks. I mean, they, they rocked it up and became incredibly popular in India. Um, I think that. We should understand that not everyone thinks that it's the best idea in the world for China's internet companies to even be looking at international markets. Uh, like Josh said, I mean, they, they have 100 million users here. That's, that's a lot of, of runway ahead of them here. There's a lot of opportunity in China. I think that your investors and the analysts who, who follow you maybe would think it was to a particularly good idea for you to be focusing a lot of, of resources on international markets where there's still many op market opportunities here. Think of it like, I mean, I, I've used this metaphor before, but we, you know, our analysts and our investors think of us as a tribe of Ice Age hunters who are really good at hunting and, and, and taking down woolly mammoths. 
and we've just taken down a huge old herd of woolly mammoths. And we're there with our flint, flake stone axes, carving up woolly mammoth meat, and fighting off the 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 the, the, you know, the, the vultures and, and the uh, other uh, scavengers to protect this this big herd of woolly, woolly mammoth carcasses that we brought down. They they want us to be doing this and not going, hey. Check those caribou out over there. Okay, yeah, we don't know how to hunt them. We don't necessarily, we don't know anything about how they, you know, react to noise or to fire or whether we can stampede them off the cliffs. Or, we don't know anything about hunting them, but hey, they look pretty tasty, so off we go. No, they're not going to reward us for that kind of an approach. They want us to keep our eye on the ball and to keep carving up that woolly mountain flesh, right? which is uh, I mean, understandable. But then, but then what is the desire to go out there? At some point, the woolly mountains go extinct. <laughs> but not, I'm going to take this metaphor only that far. <laughs> it no longer is of any use. Do you have anything to add to this, Mark? Yeah, sure. Uh, we, we, <laughs> we've talked to uh, a lot of foreign tech companies who have tried to come in or have come into the Chinese market and you know, over a lot of years. And many of them made some very basic blunders uh, that had nothing to do with the China market. Uh, in many cases, they had uh, you know, headquarters overseas that were so excited about China that they basically smothered their China operations. They constantly made requests for updates and reports to the point that they couldn't actually operate you know, against a field of very nimble domestic competitors uh, who didn't have that same responsibility. But this is a tough market. You know? So we've talked to people who, say, in the e-commerce field, who said you know, we wanted to go open a new warehouse in such and such province or city. And we had a meeting with you know, 10, 15 guys from local government, none of whom had business cards. Just sort of came in, so we couldn't quite tell who was who. And they said, this is great. We're excited that you want to come here. Uh, we'd like you to open up a joint venture here. Like, well, no, that doesn't make sense. We're just trying to open a warehouse. Um, oh, sure, OK, we, uh, you know, I guess we understand your situation. Um, we'd like a cut of your transfer price. So everything you put you know, in the warehouse, give us 5%. And you know we've got a board back in the U.S. or Europe or somebody that we have to report to who's never going to allow us to do that. So I, I can't do that. I can't function that way. Um, that's you know probably a very uh, more common practice here. It's fine in this market. It's just something that those firms can't do. For Chi Chinese firms that go overseas, they no longer have that advantage. Uh, they're on a much more even playing field. Now that said. We've seen a very clear evolution here. We used to look at many of the internet companies here where the philosophy was we have to develop everything in-house. So we're going to do an online video business, and we're going to do an e-commerce business, and we're just going to you know, keep throwing things against the wall and see what sticks. And business after business after business failed. I mean, this is all coming from a, a backdrop where it used to be a search company and an e-commerce company, and you know, three video companies, and, you know, the, where each one had a very clear segment. Then they all started getting into each other's segments, um, but doing everything in-house. A lot of failures. And at some point, really, the, I would say that the, the, where it became clearest to me is when you guys went and did the deal with uh, Providence Equity and launched IGE. It was this idea that, you know, we're not so good at this. <coughs> Those guys are really good at this. So if we do a JV with them, or if we acquire them, stay a little hands off, let them go about their business, we can integrate them into our ecosystem. And that has continued to gain momentum and gain momentum to the point now where as a, a strategy for going overseas, the idea that we have to go overseas and start everything from scratch is it's out the window. Let's go overseas and buy Lenovo's, you know, I mean, let's buy IBM's PC, personal PC, or, I'm sorry, PC let's division. Buy let's buy their server brand. Let's buy Motorola. You know, you can go do this. And so we're seeing this increasingly where uh, all of the leading internet companies here are going abroad and, and buying major assets, buying um, major intelligence um, in terms of, you know, you, I mean, people you've got in Silicon Valley right now are some of the, the best and the brightest there are. So, so that's, that's the sort of thing we're seeing in terms of strategy. Um, we've seen a very similar progression path uh, with the telecom uh, gear makers, the uh, equipment makers and handset makers. Um, the Huawei's and the ZTEs, where uh, similarly, when they first tried to go into Western Europe, they would show up to a meeting, uh, you know, in a sweater vest and a, uh, you know, with no PR firm and no consulting firm, and 
and they'd say, hey, we'll, you know, we'll just keep working on your system and get the bugs out. We'll, we'll have 20 guys stay overnight and work on it for a month until it's perfect. And nobody would do business with them. Well, we're not going to do that. We, you know, if we're going to launch this system, it has to be perfect from day one. Our, our customers won't accept that we gradually work the bugs out. And over time, this started going into other markets that were, you know, uh, you know African markets, Southeast Asian markets, building uh, reference networks there. So, you know, moving both up the chain in terms of uh, more developed markets, but also in terms of more developed technologies. So starting with things like optical networking, you know, working their way up to 3G. Um, uh, you know, so you do a 3G network in uh, Ethiopia, and that, that becomes your uh, demo network for the contract that you win from a fourth tier operator in Holland, and gradually work your way up. So that's been a very successful strategy, and I, you know, I think we're going to see a uh, similar approach from some of the internet companies. I mean, I think it's a very intelligent approach to go into markets where uh, people are not already wedded to a certain provider. Um, in terms of hardware, you know, you look at a company like Xiaomi, um, they've got an incredible competitive advantage going into a market like India because it's a very price sensitive market. Um, so do I need to be the technology leader? Do I have to be the one who came out with the newest you know, retina display or you know, voice recognition or you know, whatever the newest technology is? Not really. I just have to come out with a product that's good enough to have the price. Okay. So you mentioned this, or you talked about this a little bit, but foreign companies when they come into China, and Chinese companies when they leave China, they can buy foreign companies and buy foreign brands. So as a foreign company, when I come into China, I can't buy, buy a Chinese brand to go forward. Can I? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a issue. You don't have Microsoft coming in and buying Huawei or something. It, it depends on what sector you're getting into. So if you're a foreign telecom operator, no, you can't come in and buy China Mobile. Uh, you can't even buy a, a majority stake in China Mobile. You can buy a minority stake. Um, uh, can you, you know, freely come up and come in and set up uh, a data center as Alibaba has <coughs> just done in Silicon Valley? Not really. Um, so they're just. Uh, a lot more areas where you're more circumscribed. Um, you can certainly come in and buy certain types of companies. Um, and of course, you know, through a VIE structure, there are lots of other things that you can do where you may not have bought this company, but uh, become essentially the controller of this company. But there are examples. I mean, Amazon, not sure you. It's, oh, many, oh, yeah. There's yeah. many, many examples of this. Uh, eBay, when they came in in 2004, was it? Mm -hmm. When they, like, each yeah. they beat by each now. There are plenty of any of the instances. Okay. But not in telecoms. Right? But telecom aside though, isn't it, there's certain difficulties for foreign companies to come into China, aren't there? Well, there's certain types of businesses that are, are not allowed to play in China. So, for example, Facebook. So can you? Yeah. Um, if they, you know, potentially wanted to come up, come in and set up a local business, uh, they, they could do that. It would have to uh, conform to all the local rules and it wouldn't be able to connect to their global business. Um, so that, that's what you're getting at is you're suggesting that there's protectionist barriers that, that the Chinese government has erected against competition by certain in, in certain and there certainly are there's no question but when we're talking about consumer internet companies um, while now from the vantage point of 2015 you can see in very recent years uh, the so-called Great Firewall of China had or you know, uh, censorship requirements are certainly a major impediment to that to anyone thinking about it now we need to roll back and look, look, look at the period when those did not exist. So uh, if you go back prior to 2008, Facebook was not blocked, Twitter was not blocked, uh, YouTube was not blocked, uh, Google was not just not blocked, but they were here operating in China according, uh, according to the Chinese rules. eBay was not blocked. Uh, Amazon you know, wasn't really a huge operator here, but in e uh, let's, let's just take each of these. In their product categories, they were all distant also rents behind local Chinese competitors. I think that what we're, what we're really talking about here is putting a manager in to compete against an entrepreneur in a product category. And who's going to win? Who's more, who has more of a stake in, in winning? The entrepreneur does. I mean, he's going to be the guy working 18, 20 hours a day. He's the one who's going to be pouring his heart and soul to it. Uh, he's, he or she is going to be the one who uh, really uh, sweats blood, I mean, you know, puts blood, sweat, and tears into, into, into the company. Uh, yeah, I think there would be, many of these companies just never really stood much of a chance against the equally well-funded, scrappy, uh, incredibly hungry entrepreneurs 
you get somebody who, like, as Mark said, uh, has a, a, a kind of ridiculous structure. Either they're smothered with love, or they're the redheaded stepson who's outside of the. the I mean, who, who, who has to have their hand up for a long time before they, they, they get the CEO's attention or they get called out in class. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think it's this is sort of framed as a as a as a tech discussion, but I think that this is probably true across all industries that you have foreign companies coming in and. and and you know, as Patty was saying, you need to figure out how to do it locally. So uh, there are specific areas of investment that are limited, but I think that the bigger issue is how do you compete in the areas that, where you can compete. And, uh, for the most part, foreign companies have struggled to do so. Uh, sometimes that's because of specific barriers in place, uh, but frequently that's also because of uh, management strategies uh, that don't recognize um, the global market need. So I, I think this is partially a tech issue, but it's, it's probably a really broader issue about China. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to add to that. I mean, you know, we've seen the sort of difficulties uh, recently that Alibaba has had. Uh, the State Administration for Industry and Commerce saying that you know we found that X percent of your products on your platform are <laughs> fake. Um, and again, you know, there are many ways in which this market is more forgiving, or rather, in which there are certain business practices which uh, a foreign company or the foreign board just can't engage. Um, so that you know, can't be uh, some other foreign e-commerce provider and come into this market and have the same thing be true, or, or be even be accused of that. Um, <coughs> to sound like a cynic, though, but the Alibaba example, for instance, why did they wait so long until after their IPO? Done this before. According to media sources, they already had this information. Well, Alibaba disputes that. <laughs> Alibaba disputes that. They say that in that July meeting, this, that they were not aware of that white paper. Yeah. Uh, I believe I just said something. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think what we had seen from Psych was them saying that we, they actually said something to the effect that we, we did have this discussion with you and uh, we chose not to bring it up until after your IPO. So there's not too much to say about that. It's pretty that that at least is transparent. All right. So I would like to move on a bit more. So we know that China's led the way in certain industries and certain you know, emerging zones. In gaming, free to play was a big thing in China. So in that case, the hotel was a big thing in China. That was all stuff. <laughs> so. I'm just curious, just show of hands, who understands what, what is referred to when people say O2O? Okay, so it's very, very simple. It stands for online to offline. Um, and it's it's something which I think, tellingly, um, for a largely Anglophone audience, it's not uh, it's not on their lips. I mean, almost anybody in the sector in China certainly knows that that, that much. Word. I mean, it's, it's a very buzzword thing. Um, this is part of a, a sort of larger... Can I add to your definition? Say O to O is something that will increase your valuation by 25. Yeah, if something will <laughs> say O to O, it immediately knocks your valuation up 25. percent That's great. Uh, so everyone remember that if you're ever pitching. So um, once upon a time, you know, we, we all talk about that that the, the trifecta the, of, of Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, BAT. Um, we used to talk about a world that Mark was talking about this earlier, where you know Baidu connected people to information, Alibaba connected people to products, Tencent connected people to other people. <coughs> uh, thank you for saving me from being crushed. <laughs> I don't think it's legal. But, um, no longer the case. I think that the, the what changed everything was these these devices that we're all carrying around with us. Uh, where suddenly it became really possible for all three of these, these major players to start to connect people with services. Right? Uh, and when you're speaking narrowly of O2O, uh, you're talking generally about your spas and your gyms and, and your restaurants, of course, and your coffee houses and your movie theaters and your retail outlets. You're connecting people with services. But in a more general sense, connecting people with services are, you know, would, would include with healthcare providers, with educational institutions, with insurance. Uh, uh, companies and, and so forth. These are all services, and financial, of course, financial services. These are all services that, that the internet can help connect uh, people to. This is a whole new uh, opportunity uh, 
for most, I mean, so your company uh, is an exception, but except for the e-commerce the, the e sites, most internet companies have traditionally made their money on what, advertising, right? We're all competing for a rather narrow sliver of the total budgetary outlays of a given uh, customer. Um, and that's their, their online marketing budget, right? That's not really uh, where we want to be necessarily. What, what we, we'd rather be dipping our ladles directly in to the revenue streams that these companies receive. Uh, we, we'd like to take a cut at the till, right, at when a transaction is being made. And if an internet company can close a loop completely on a transaction from when I decide, hey, I think I want to see a movie this afternoon, and then I go online and I, I find out where the movie theaters are and uh, what's showing there. And I can, if I can buy my, if can pick my seats and buy my tickets and I can close that loop, you know, that internet company will be taking some money. And this isn't advertising money anymore. It's actually a piece of the much bigger overall revenue picture, right? Uh, so this is obviously something that's highly interesting is why is it that Chinese companies have gotten so far ahead uh, in this area? Uh, I have a couple of theories as to why. One of them, I mean, is sort of more banal. It's that uh, a couple of years ago, if you'll remember, there was something like 2,000 Groupon clones in, in this space in China. Do, do you guys remember this? When it was the deal of the day sites, I mean, they weren't just the deal of the day, the, the many deals of, a, of any time, given time, uh, were everywhere. I mean, everyone was, was creating these Groupon clone sites. Uh, so there were armies of local sales teams knocking on the doors of every local noodle shop, every hairdresser, every, every you know, spa, every gym, every you know, blind masseuse. You, 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 you could get you know, these, these discounts from these places, and they recognized that this was bringing foot traffic to their doors. This was bringing in, this, you know, that these, these might not have been successful business models. They were taking way too big of a cut in, in, in many of the cases, but uh, they realized that, that there was a potential in this, and suddenly we had all these local sales teams all tra trained up. Uh, I think Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent all realized, look, we have the wherewithal to do real online to offline. We all have maps. We all have these these big kind of Swiss Army knife applications that everyone uses all the time. Things like Baidu Search or Baidu Maps or, or, or uh, Tencent's WeChat, uh, Wasting. I mean, who doesn't use Wasting in this room, right? I probably, yeah, like one person doesn't use Wasting in this room. Okay, two. All right. I mean, it's 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 crazy. So they're all uh, geared to do this, right? They all have maps. And they all have uh, some kind of search capability, some better than others, right? uh, and the ability to deliver right, like, these these deals um, and, and large local teams. And we actually even acquired uh, Nomi from Rinrin, which is one of the, the bigger, one of the three or four biggest uh, uh, Groupon clone companies. And so. Baidu was, was, was quite active in this early on. Uh, this became a real kind of mainstay of our whole O2O play. So today, you can go to Baidu Maps, you can you know, tap on uh, search vicinity, you can tap on any subway station or any point that's clickable, tap on search vicinity, you can see the list of all the different services that you want, you can do a closed loop on transaction. And this, is, this is, I mean, it's remarkable. When I went back to the States, I was talking to a lot of my friends. This isn't happening quite at the same scale. Chinese people eat out a lot more, granted. Chinese people you know, uh, are, are more apt to do out-of-home consumption. But um, that's just, just, just part of it. I think that there's the willingness of the merchants to embrace new technologies like this. I mean, they're very, very eager to do this. And the competitive hunger among the three major internet players here to drive uh, O2O forward, that's probably what accounts for, for the difference. Gentlemen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, going back to the earlier point about the way consumers operate in China, it's, it's important to remember that it wasn't that long ago that there wasn't much of a retail sector built up, there wasn't much of a service sector built up. Um, I think that that's one of the reasons that, that e-commerce has taken off uh, so quickly because uh, you didn't have the Walmart type networks that you have in the U.S. You don't have uh, people that are, people aren't used to going to these great department stores, uh, or adequate department stores, uh, like they may be in other markets. In China, it's, it's a fairly new development. Um, these sectors just aren't very, haven't traditionally been built up particularly well. So it's a little bit like uh, in a lot of markets where 
like in Africa where people didn't generally have landlines, or actually even in China where people traditionally didn't have landlines, it's a much easier transition to just skip over the landline and go right to cell phones. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that you see that, you're certainly seeing that in retail. Uh, I think that O to O is probably uh, somewhat of the same, you know, it's in the same vein. Uh, similarly, all, all, of, all of the people who are running businesses here, it's, it's a relatively new thing. If you're in Europe or the U.S., uh, you know, a barbershop may have been open for 50 or 100 years. They may not be as eager to switch over to a new technology and, and also for the consumers. It's, it's just a, it's, it's a more natural transition in China. I'll add on to that uh, here, the much lower cost, uh, relative to cost of fulfillment. Um, so we probably see, you know, we, we produce a daily industry news brief. So we're looking at Chinese news media, and every day we see two, three new deals for Odo, Series A, Series B. And increasingly they're getting more and more specific. So uh, there's a service where you can be out doing shopping and you notice your nails or, you know, you don't quite have the luster they had yesterday. And type it in on you know, your phone and someone will come and do your nails while you're having lunch or whatever you're doing. Um, uh, there's another app where if you want raise money. Somebody raise money. Do you have the name of the app? I, I, not off the top of my head. Someone said it. Someone said it. You know, there's a, uh, another app where, uh, you know, I'd like to have dinner tonight, um, but you know, I'd kind of like to have it at home, and I'd like someone to do the shopping, and I'd like them to cook it for me at my home, and I'd like them to wash the dishes when they're done. And it cost me 86 Y. For, I mean, the ingredients separate, but to get all the shopping done, the cooking, That's the dishes. That's called I-I-E, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> the difference being that this person is actually a chef who it has a huge repertoire of different uh, cooking styles, and, or at least you can choose this one this night and this one the next night instead of do a rotation of eight dishes or whatever it's been. Not really, but in my eye. Um, um, but point being that, you know, there's one after the next and the next, and, and they're all very doable because the cost of fulfillment here is you know, quite low, whereas in Western Europe, the U.S., Japan, that would be expensive and not possible. Um, the other one is uh, a certain amount of inefficiency that's being closed through these applications. And I think the taxi hailing apps is a great example of this here. Um, when I first moved here uh, almost 13 years ago, I could walk out of my building and there'd be four, five, six taxis just lined up waiting, just hop in one and go. And over time, they all disappeared. And it got to the point where, you know, there would be a taxi going by and I would wave and he would. <laughs> and, uh, what's going on? And what was going on? Because you're scary. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? This monstrously tall, angry bald guy. <laughs> what's going on is the taxi drivers were not being allowed to increase their fares here. And the cost of oil was going through the roof. And so increasingly you were getting these situations where a taxi driver didn't want to pick you up unless you were going exactly where he was going, or somewhere along his or her route. Um, and, and so I'm sitting out there for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, trying to get a cab, thinking I would gladly pay an extra 10 room and B to get one now. Boom. And so you have Didi Dacha and you know, all, you know, all these others, Didi Dacha. Um, correct, emerged. Um, so th these are a couple of the other things that I think have really made this a prime market for hotel. Cool. Um, Kaiser touched on this earlier, talking about uh, artificial intelligence and big data. So now moving past Oto, what is the next big trend in technology in China? What will we see in the future? Will we see something more like in Japan with elder care, building robotic suits to carry old people upstairs? What will we see coming in China in the near future? <laughs> <laughs> Driverless cars. From, uh, yeah, so driverless cars. Yeah, I mean, uh, we don't. We're not doing fully driverless cars. We don't believe in going from that binary zero to fully automated. We we think that the auto industry really wants a, a more sensible migration, so that uh, automation will kick in when you're doing things that drivers find to be especially in China, like parallel parking. It's going to put an entire. I mean, I put a lot of people out of work whose job is to go stop, 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 stop. Those, those guys will be out of work, but 
you know, that's called disruption. But anyway, uh, driving, I mean, so like shifting lanes, uh, but there's a lot of technologies that need to be in place in order to, to make this, you know, uh, a reality here. And I think that those are actually things that we ought, ought, ought I mean, in the very near term, we should be on the on lookout for. Um, so I have this kind of theory about, um, you guys make a driverless bicycle. We, we, we have one, but it's just, it's just for fun. I mean, we sort of, you know, did it just, I mean, it's not a lot of commercial potential. So we just wanted to show that, you know, it was possible to, to, to um, you know, have a two-wheeled vehicle that could, that, that could navigate. Um, the, uh, you know, a driver's automobile, in order for it to, to, to really work well, it needs to have extraordinarily good computer vision on board. It needs to understand. Like, if I'm driving along, you know, a desert highway, I mean, I don't think they have tumbleweeds in Gansu or whatever, but and where I grew up in Arizona, you know, there were tumbleweeds all over the place. You'd see tumbleweeds go by. You know, if you slammed on your brakes every time you saw a tumbleweed because you thought it was actually a boulder, you'd be in trouble, right? I mean, so the computer vision needs to be able to figure out what is, uh, you know, what's, 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 I mean, rabbits you can just run over, but no, deer you probably don't want to. Right? Um, uh, a tumbleweed versus a boulder, that, that's, that's a very good, important thing to be able to do. To be able to read dynamic signs, signs that change all the time. When, uh, uh, to be able to, to do, uh, you know, it's, it's very real time, very fast uh, image, basically image search is what we're talking about, vision, computer vision. Uh, we're uh, developing technologies around that. It needs to be able to respond to voice commands very, very well, very, very accurately. But, uh, and in a noisy environment, like inside a car or a rough road, and, you, know, it's, you need to be able to hear the voice commands that are being given. We think that, that it's basic technologies like this that, that are, are fundamental before we can start talking about um, you know, uh, true, fully automated uh, driving experiences. Um, the advantage of being a Chinese company here, is that you straddle these two very different markets. Here we are in, in a city where we have 78% internet penetration, we have over 100% cell phone penetration, where uh, you have a you know, very, very high degree of smartphone penetration. You know, 4G use is much higher in the coastal cities, 3G use is much higher in, in, in the coastal cities. Level of sophistication among users and among consumers, uh, I mean, among, among customers, that's, that's quite high. But if you go not too terribly far away into the, into the wilds of Hubei province, you'll find you know very very low levels of internet penetration, correspondingly low levels of sophistication. I remember you know when I got my first iPad, uh, my kids when they were you know real young, they would they they figured out you know that you could expand photos and stuff like that, and they figured that every framed photo they saw could be expanded with their fingers, right? But you you guys know how your older relatives, your grandparents, were, how they do search, right? It's, I mean, they write full sentences. They don't know Boolean algebra. They don't know how to use excluder words. They're going to type, I wonder whether they still have that delicious apple cup. <laughs> I mean, they're going to write, type in these full sentences in, in natural language. And uh, the expectation is that you, the technology should be able to handle it. So what I'm suggesting is that actually to serve the needs of these underserved people, the less sophisticated people, it's not a matter of taking your existing top technology and dumbing it down to meet their, their, it's actually a technology challenge. You need to build smart systems to be able to understand those natural language inputs. You need to make everything correspond to what everyone assumes is going to be the most intuitive interface. And on a mobile device, the most intuitive interfaces are speech, and, and, and uh, visual. Uh, if after, later on I can demo some stuff for you if you guys want, if you're gonna hang out later on, I mean, you can take a picture of this guy's sweater right now, but he stands up, I take a picture of his sweater, uh, on, on by the search, and it, it will take you directly to an e-commerce, uh, to a whole bunch of different e-commerce shop choices where I can buy that uh, same, you know, navy uh, v-neck sweater, right? Uh, it, it, it's visual recognition, or a handbag that I like, or, or a pair of shoes eventually. So visual search and voice recognition, and these are these are I think the the they're going to be really really important technologies in the very near future. Yeah. So and, I mean I think if you look in China, most of the major technologies that have come out uh, globally have not come from China. Uh, you know, the most of the major leaps forward. But uh, if you look at incremental technology advances, I think there's there's been a lot that's been done. So you know, something like WeChat. Um, WeChat isn't a totally new idea, right? It, it comes from uh, a number of different messaging apps and things like that. But if you if, if you were to just say that WeChat is a knockoff a knockoff of uh, Line, WhatsApp, or whatever, it's, it's a little bit like saying that the iPhone is just a knockoff of, of, of 
of BlackBerry. I mean, it's, it's just not accurate. Uh, so I, I think that that's probably, and then in e-commerce, uh, I mean, if you look at what we do in terms of same-day delivery, you know, we've been doing that for five years using, using our system to figure out which warehouses need to have what products. Uh, obviously, the, uh, uh, the, the cost of delivery makes a big difference as well. Um, but I think that you see a lot of these kinds of uh, incremental technology advances that companies elsewhere in the world end up uh, following on. Um, so I, I think that that's probably the, the, the area that you're going to see the most advancement in China. Yeah. Just to add that <clears throat> Kaiser beat me to the punch on image and voice recognition. And <clears throat> I think in, particularly in China, uh, you know, if you're trying to do any sort of input in Chinese, uh, it's cumbersome, and especially on a mobile device. So anything that allows you to interface with a machine more easily. So not only are we seeing things, you know, more developing in areas like voice recognition, image recognition, but also in things, I guess, related to that, things like facial recognition, uh, eyeball recognition. Um, we saw one recently, you know, I think, I think uh, certainly from Alibaba, I think uh, we, we Bank from uh, <coughs> Tencent was also looking at this, where I can be at my computer, uh, my camera on my computer takes a picture of my face, matches it against the database, and it sets up a bank account for me. So anything that cuts out steps or lets me interface more easily with, with my mobile device or with my PC. Um, those are a couple of those things. Um, and then uh, smart home, smart car, you know, all things that are, you know, internet of things, all, you know, all things. And already we're seeing a tremendous amount in that area. Your company's doing a lot in that area. Xiaomi's doing a lot in that area. I mean, basically all of the major internet companies right now are figuring out how to build smart home. Um, Meaning, you know, specifically that, uh, you know, whether it's a refrigerator or a humidifier or a air purifier or, uh, you know, whatever it is in my home, uh, I can activate it, have it turn on, uh, have it do something for me through my mobile phone. Right now, that might be through typing some a command into my mobile phone. Subsequently, it will be me just speaking to my mobile phone. Do it. Um, <clears throat> It, in along those lines, uh, more in terms of uh, sensor-related technology as well. Um, a little further out, you'll start to get into things like you know more cutting-edge technology, where um, they're able to <coughs> anticipate what you're thinking based on sort of the uh, you've seen this research already, right? Um, um, so based on sort of the uh, electric charge, the sort of uh, you know sort of pre-fire, pre-synapse. Um, or sort of your eye movement, you know, how your eye is moving before you actually act. Um, so, but that's still a little further out. All right, so you mentioned about um, smart home and how competition is fierce between the mobile and the company, so building into it. Yeah. So how fierce is the competition? How cutthroat is the industry right now? Um, I'm not sure how to quantify that, but... Um, well, what example I, I, I guess what I'll say is, right now you're seeing a, a, a you know, very heavy move into hardware. Um, so sort of back into hardware, right? There was this period where it was some you think leaving software. hardware is all software now. Very much, you know, back into hardware, um, and companies realizing that uh, if, you know, if I really want to control the full ecosystem, I need to control not just the software but the hardware. Um, so we're seeing a lot of Chinese companies taking major stakes in uh, handset companies, um, various other consumer electronics companies or home appliance companies. Um, like Xiaomi investing in BD. Correct. Uh, Chi Hu is doing something in that space. Just see. <laughs> so, um, so it's very, very competitive, um, and you know, so at this we're point, all using cool pad at, devices. At this, right? <laughs> at this point, you know, basically, you know, Xiaomi aside, every major uh, domestic handset vendor has you know, done a deal with one of the major internet companies, uh, and you'll see this right down the line. Very heavy competition with uh, leading device maker. Do you want to add to this, Josh? No, I can't. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's the question? Yeah. So, let's start questions then. Uh, this gentleman had his hand up. Hi, guys. Really interesting. Uh, I work for United Nations. Uh, United Nations has just set up a big data lab. I do. And the first, uh, first project is support electronic waste management in China. 
uh, from this project, I realized the biggest potential impact of internet technology upon human being is actually how we look at space. Because fundamentally, for thousands of years, we have been looking at space by urban and rural. But now, with the, you mentioned O2O -O solutions, it looks like uh, the fundamental uh, uh, foundation of the old, the traditional way of defining space, a city, is collapsing because the fundamental thing of the city is the physical existence of market. But just look at them around us. All the supermarkets are collapsing. And with auto wheel solutions, I think it's, uh, it's, the, it's the time for us to redefine space. And uh, I think now, I think uh, now Alibaba is very aggra aggressive in developing exclusive contract with uh, cities in China uh, with regard for the smart city development. I believe also uh, uh, Tencent and, and Baidu are also doing the similar thing. So what is your strategy? Could you basically describe it? Uh, and, and what does this mean for China? Because I think also this is a unique opportunity for China because China just reached 50% urbanization rate and we have to leapfrog to 70%. Otherwise, we will fall into the mid middle income country uh, trap. Well, in the developed world, you already reach your upper limit of urbanization rate. Uh, rate. So what is the uh, opportunity for you to compete in the real space world and what is the opportunity for China? Yeah, I think uh, I'm probably the only person here who has to address this one, right? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that uh, it's uh, smart cities is not just a natural but an, an absolutely necessary next step. And there's nobody who's better positioned than the, the, the People who are already sort of in the business of doing big data, data collection, uh, and who have you know that level of both, both, both the data and, and the uh, computational capability to do this, we we are working with municipalities already. I can't be too specific about what we're doing exactly. We're at the stage right now where we're really trying to understand the problem, really trying to figure out what metrics we really need to apply in order to optimize solutions for this. Uh, we've taken some, some baby steps in, 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 in sort of smaller micro areas where lessons can be learned uh, for, for larger uh, complex systems like cities. Cities are extraordinarily complex systems, right? I mean, we're talking about orders of complexity that we you know the, the, a, a, a planning commission can't understand. We need that kind of data. We need to we know, first of all, what we want to gather uh, and how we're going to gather it and how we're going to process it. And what really, you know, what are what are our, what is optimization? You know, what what ultimately is you know uh, bringing efficiency to it? The work we're doing, for example, in our internet data centers, um, we are I mean, data centers are again they're very complex. There's a lot of as you would uh, traffic that is routed around and a lot of inefficiency still. This is not a problem that a lot of people have, have, have paid money to. But this is this represents an enormous outlay of capital. I mean, the bandwidth costs and the cooling the electricity costs. There are so many areas in which we can save money. I'll just name one of them in which, I mean, I think it sort of hints at the future uh, that artificial intelligence and big data can bring to this. Um, in our internet data centers right now, um, when a hard drive fails, it, it's, it's, it can be very, very uh, deadly. There's a lot of, you know, load balancing problems that end up as a result of this. There's a lot of, there's costs. You know, some people won't be shown uh, displayed. Uh, they won't have search engine results displayed. We actually lose revenue as a result of this happening. If we were able to predict when a hard drive, a particular hard drive, were, were going to crash, we could hot swap out that hard drive beforehand and, and prevent any of this from happening. Uh, and we, we've done this. We've figured out what the signature is, what, what behavioral ticks we can see in a hard drive in, in the, the hours, the, the minutes, the hours uh, before it actually crashes. And when we can see those, we can now predict with 85% accuracy uh, uh, any crash that happens. We're, we're catching 85% of crashes before they happen within a 24-hour period and saving an estimated 17 million yen on this. Um, it, this is very uh, important. So this is just one example. You know, we should be able to, to, to predict a lot of things in, in smart cities. You know, we should be able to predict tra traffic bottlenecks. I mean, some of them, I mean, any more I can predict. Like, you know, one, I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a Beijing survival mint. You pay attention to which, less, uh, which, which license plate numbers are blocked. What day uh, are, we, are you going to see a huge surge in traffic when what, what license number is blocked? Three, four, no, four. Yeah. Right. License people do not like license plates that end in the number four for for you know anyone who's and so there are very few license plates that end in the number four. Therefore, when the number four and its corresponding number 
uh, which would be nine, are blocked in China, are in, in Beijing, you can count on there being really ridiculously bad traffic, right? So just just simple, you know, things that we can predict just as, as humans and all this stuff, we would be able uh, to, to bring that, that to, to bear. Um, check out trends.baidu.com sometime. There's a lot of fun to be had there. We, we show off a lot of our predictive technologies on this. It's all entirely free to use, but you can, you can look at, you know, uh, predictions of, of travel patterns, of of, of the crowding at, at, at popular tourist destinations and, and uh, disease outbreak of, of a whole range of, of diseases, everything from uterine cancer to tuberculosis to uh, right, I'm sorry, but I have to cut you off because you can't go on about All right. it forever. I'm sorry. Uh, Smart cities. Yes, we're building on this. Sorry, you finished your answer in that time. Um, what do you have? You any thoughts on Tencent's decision to stop um, investing in marketing overseas, which it announced I think last last week sometime? It says it's, it was a bit of a waste of money, so it's just going to put that money instead into developing in South in um, China. And the other the other question is, uh, the largest single shareholder in Tencent is a South African company. Um, That's person. That's person. Yeah. Um, I know that goes through the BIE and all that, but do you think there's any um, challenge or any potential threat to that structure? I mean, are the Chinese authorities always going to be happy with having a foreign shareholder being so dominant? Well, I can start with the, uh, the, um, the WeChat question. Um, I, I mean, I think what Tencent basically said was that they're going to, uh, they're, they're not giving up on the international market by Turn on investment in the short term uh, isn't worth it in their mind. But I, I think what is uh, what may be missed underneath that is the, the development that they're doing domestically in terms of uh, integrating a, a lot more different capabilities uh, into the application. Uh, and, and so it's, it's kind of a shift in focus. So um, I don't think that they're giving up on the international market generally. Uh, but in the short term, that's not where they want to put the money. But I think what we will see is, in terms of those types of apps, um, and, and, and JD.com knows this quite well because we're integrated into, into WeChat and hence as a strategic partner of ours. Uh, the, the capabilities in WeChat are far more advanced than what you see in uh, similar types of applications elsewhere. And I think that you're, you're going to continue to see them uh, expand those capabilities and uh, Test different functionalities that they that they may be able to use internationally in the long term. Um, so I, I, don't, I think it's just you know I, I'm not speaking for Tencent, but based on what I've read, it looks like it's an it's a, it's a issue for the short term in terms of do they want to spend uh, tens of tens of millions of dollars marketing that abroad, or do they want to continue to develop the technology domestically in a market where they already have hundreds of millions of users. <coughs> Uh, in terms of NASPERS and uh, VIE structure, uh, I, you know, I think you likely will see a shift in that structure in the future. But I think the companies that are already, uh, you know, basically, the companies that are already invested, you'll almost certainly see grandfathered in. Um, I, you know, I think at this point to uh, do something drastic where you, uh, you know, try to shuffle them out. Uh, would be too damaging in terms of you know what other investors, how other investors would see China. Um, now that said, uh, it wouldn't be the first time we've seen something like that. Uh, you know, you don't have to go back too far. Probably about uh, if you want a great example, look at 94, 95 time frame, China Unicom. Uh, you know, at the time, a new operator uh, needed a lot of capital to get built. Um, a lot of foreign companies were interested to invest, but technically were not allowed to invest. Uh, ended up coming in on what's called a Zhong Zhong Wai, which is not unlike a VIE. It's a China China foreign structure where the foreign investor invests in a uh, <clears throat> in one company in China. That company pushes the money to another, and then that one invests in China Unicom. And that went on uh, somehow magically, uh, you know, unnoticed until China Unicom built out the first stage of its network uh, and was able to start earning revenue, which then it could plow back into expanding that network, at which point suddenly the regulator noticed this and said, oh, I'm sorry, but all of you got to go. Um, now, did they tell them you've got to leave and you know, you'll get your money back? 
no. They said, we understand you've invested, so we're going to, of course, return your money uh, with a fabulous 7% return. Um, you know, for that sort of risk profile, you're probably looking at a minimum 50% return, if not more. So uh, how well do people remember that? Has that stopped other investors from coming back to invest in China? Not at all. Um, so, so, you know, so I won't say, you know, that uh, NASPERS or other foreign investors in major uh, Chinese internet companies uh, don't have to think about it, um, but I think overall you're doing at least to get grandfathered. Also, I mean, remember Tencent is on, on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. They don't have the SEC um, you know, creating potential problems for them on the VIE structure. Great. Next question. Hi, thanks. Um, I want to know, uh, in the States, uh, there's a big expansion of software as a service platform, SaaS companies, and uh, that's really the hot thing in investment now. Um, but I don't really see that uh, very much in China. Um, and I'm just wondering if maybe I'm missing something or if you see, because uh, you talked a lot about, you all talked a lot about B2C. Um, uh, for B2B, do you see a big growth happening or about to happen for software as a service or major B2B players? If they would add O to O. Q to B. We actually do see a, a, a fair amount. They, they, they tend not to get as much press. They're just not as, as sexy. Um, so, you know, uh, if you go out and talk to any of the VCs out here, uh, there are a lot who are looking at a lot of different uh, SaaS opportunities. So there's definitely, definitely things going on that you just don't hear about as much. Are there some big examples? Um, I, not off the top of my head, uh, you know, again, uh, you're just not seeing them, I'm not seeing them every day, so I have a, you know, a list uh, of companies, but none that I can just read off. Yeah, I have a question about the Chinese IT companies listed abroad. Has anyone made a, made a study of investment patterns, who buys these into these companies? Because uh, with the government of control freaks like China, how can they allow, uh, you know, strategically sensitive companies to be listed abroad and open to anyone to control? Well, I'll, I'll throw a few things at that. Um, in some cases, uh, they've just taken them back. So if you look at uh, RDA, microelectronics, or spread from both of those were listed in New York. They're both uh, handset chip companies. Um, China brought them both private again, and now they're under uh, Tsinghua uh, Tongfang, um, so basically a state-owned enterprise. Um, base pass, correct. Um, and they're, you know, they're basically being uh, merged, and now they've got investment and cooperation from Intel. Um, and, you know, so they're being positioned to, to, you know, to basically take on uh, global handset uh, chip companies. Um, so, so you, and, and you know th that's just one example of many. We've seen a lot of overseas listed companies go private over the last couple of years. Um, I guess I'll turn it over to either of you, since that's a issue you know, immediately free to either of your companies. You, you, you've got some well, minority yeah, so, stakes, so right. We're we're listed. Uh, I mean, I think this. It's, it's even. Uh, I think your what your question is getting at is uh, how is this uh, this party state that is so concerned with. Uh, controlling the, the strategic heights of any uh, vital uh, industry. Right. And there's no arguing that, that, that the internet itself is not a strategic height within the, the broader communications uh, technology sector. Why would it be uh, allowed to be most dominated by private companies? Dominated by private companies, many of which were founded by American returnees or even uh, American green card holders or even U.S. nationals. Uh, why would it be allowed to be uh, to be capitalized mostly by foreign, in, mostly U.S. venture capital, and why would it be allowed to have uh, listing bets on on foreign bourses? Right, that's what you're you're yeah. asking. I think it's simply because it happened too quickly. I think it's simply because they could not react. They were flat-footed when it happened because it all started so quickly. Um, you know, bureaucracies are slow. Uh, internet companies are nimble, uh, in, and they uh, 
figured that the, the only way to deal with this after that point was through through regulation. Uh, but yeah, the, the sector is entirely dominated. Uh, the consumer internet sector, certainly. Uh, I mean, we're talking. You know, when, when you're talking about uh, about uh, <clears throat> chipset manufacturers, when you're talking about hardware manufacturers, it, it's a little bit different. But when you're talking about the consumer internet companies, yes, they are. It's entirely dominated by by the private sector companies, and, uh, and that, that's a very interesting question. You know, why would that have been allowed to happen? I think the only plausible answer to me is that it just happened too quickly. It was a fait accompli. They were. It was creating. Uh, a ton of value and delivering a lot of, 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 of value to the Chinese economy. They did not want to kill a goose that laid a golden egg, but they didn't want to keep that goose in, uh, in a certain kind of pen, right? I want to add to that and say, you, you know, things that are, are more recent that have been allowed and didn't have to be allowed. But, uh, so various internet companies getting into the financing sector, uh, I think there you're getting a recognition that you guys actually are more efficient at this than we are. And, and we have some issues that need resolving, and you're going to help us. Um, incredibly pragmatic. Correct. And we're seeing that uh, your company is doing a lot in uh, the crowdfunding space. And we've just seen an endorsement from Chinese authorities on crowdfunding. Um, Taxi hailing apps. <laughs> a little more. Well, it's mixed. You know, it's mixed, but even if you look at like, the yeah. sentence about Uber, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of still a lot of positive sounding like this is necessary, but it just needs to be regulated. But again, I think there's recognition, uh, you know, among other things, that uh, there are certain objectives like you know, how do we keep capital in China, Chinese capital in China, and one way we do that is allow, you know, every common investor to start being able to invest in interesting opportunities within China. So proud of that. Um, you know, similarly in terms of uh, you know the banking system and uh, Yula Bao and you know all, all these other uh, account balance uh, services, where you know I put a certain amount of money in my payment account, now it gets rolled over into money market, um, so people are happy to keep their money here in that and not trying to find some other. Option. And, and when you're talking about the, the ownership of uh, companies listed overseas, um, I mean, look, look, going back to when Baidu listed. Would Baidu have been able to raise $125 million domestically? Uh, would a company today be able to raise uh, $20, billion $20 billion domestically? And I think there's a, there's a certain reality uh, to how they proceeded. So I, I mean, I think that, that, that you know, that's very much what, uh, what Marcus was saying. This is the practicality of how things are moving forward. So if you want, I don't think it was very clear at the time that Baidu was going to be this massive success. Um, but if you go to if you go to markets abroad and you raise capital abroad, uh, people are willing to take that risk if you can put this kind of money into it. Yeah, um, what type of advice would you guys have for like young expats who are working in like Chinese internet companies or app companies, you know, and how to we could um get get like more involved in the company or just kind of like words of advice you could give for like the younger generation of people working for these new Chinese companies? And also another question for, for Kaiser as well too. I work in Yoko PR. I'm also a musician as well too. And would you be interested in maybe starting a, like an international PR internet company uh, super group? Uh, rock and roll, metal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talk to me afterwards. Okay. I used to work in Yoko PR. In fact, I kind of started it there. So. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I'll jump in. Uh, it's, you know, in terms of work. Kaiser and I are both not so much on the business side as the communication yeah. side. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you're getting into Chinese tech companies, I think we sort of went about it in a weird way. Um, so I'm not sure we're the best. Uh, Kaiser well, but he's in communications too, right, so right. I think our advice is relevant. So. Yeah. Well, well, well just for like for anybody, you know, just like the, like the, the Western and Chinese kind of gap that you know we. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, first. Uh, the language, the language comes first. I mean, Josh speaks spectacularly good Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah. but you know, it's, 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 it's good. I mean, it's, it's 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 important to have to be able to communicate. You need to know, as somebody who's going to be the spokesperson for your company, uh, what is happening in the the, the, the far flung corners of the empire. I mean, you need to, to you know to know those other things. You need to know what's going on in Shanghai. You need to know what's happening in Beijing. Um, you know, uh, with your disparate pieces of, of the business, right? And that's what, where you probably spend most of your time. I know that's where I spend most of my time, is just sort of as an internal reporter, just talking to the different product teams, constantly talking to the different business teams, 
trying to, to understand the you're keeping abreast of what's happening. That's the most value. And that you circulate that way. I mean, you become valuable to people that way. You, you're the, the, the person who's going to be telling the, the great heroic stories of what each of these product teams is doing. Uh, and you obviously already uh, in, in a, a large listed company. Uh, but for other people that are looking to get in, um, Kaiser and I both have an agency background, so I mean, I think when you're looking to get into Chinese, I actually don't. I, I didn't work in, in PR. At all. Oh, okay. All right. I have an agency background, <laughs> and um, you know, but I, I think that if you're going into um, a Chinese company, you have to. It's very helpful to bring a skill set that you already have to the company, um, and that's that's where your that's where your value comes from. I, you know. Uh, I don't. I, I think that the days where just being a foreigner in a Chinese company has value is. I think those are. It's long, long gone. Yeah. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I don't know where the mic is. So, uh, anyone have a question? Yeah. less high-tech kinds of, uh, of fraud. So I think what you tend to see is uh, there, there may be a data breach somewhere in China where login information uh, has been stolen usually from, usually from a smaller site, but not necessarily. Um, and then people will try to use the same login information uh, across a number of different platforms. Um, and since all of us have 20 or 30 logins, we, we tend to duplicate. And I think you get this sort of uh, low-tech fraud. Um, so a lot of times the answers are kind of low-tech answers, which are don't use the same password and login across all your platforms. Um, and when somebody calls you up and seems to have information about you, be suspicious. Um, so that, this is sort of on the lower tech end of it. That you have an so on the higher tech end of it, um, Obviously, it's it's mission critical for I mean, companies like like JD that hold so much, so many debit and credit card uh, accounts and have so much personal wire history. Uh, that that I mean that's before Knox, right? I mean you need to, to, to really build the walls high and thick. Um, so I mean, the same of course for for any any internet company, uh, very very important uh, for us. Uh, I mean I mean it's not like a broken record here, but the answers once again lie in artificial intelligence and computing. Uh, for, let's, let's just recently, for example, we just launched a, a new version of a uh, cybersecurity product that uh, uses very, very sophisticated deep learning and, uh, species of AI algorithms to to uh, to detect uh, pretty sophisticated. I mean, no, so virus definition. Let's just, just take a simple example of, of this, like virus definitions. You know, how are they created? How are they updated? Uh, they're not done in in a particularly smart way. Um, they're actually it's it's. Just uh, a lot of manpower and low tech crunch. If you look though, if you were able to, to scan, you know, billions and billions and billions of files very very quickly and, and to look for recurring patterns that match suspicious activity, uh, you you can vastly improve uh, real time updates and and, and uh, real identification of as yet undetected malware. We can figure out malware signatures that of, of things that haven't yet even been detected. Uh, so we're very, very happy with the performance initially of this new product that we're, that we're rolling out um, and at above enterprise level and, and for the personal you know, user of a, of a handset or, or a, a PC. Uh, yeah, absolutely mission critical for us. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a nasty environment out there. I mean, it's, it's horrific. And, and, and China is among the worst. Uh, people are, are, are loath to, uh, they're really reluctant to download patches you know, it's a Windows-dominated market. It's a it's a pirated Windows-dominated market. And people think erroneously that if they don't down, if they download uh, uh, patches, that they're going to be caught out as having a a, a fake Windows OS, and it's going to freeze up. Uh, so a lot of people are really lucky to do that, which makes it a, a target-rich environment for the cyber criminal. 
it's very bad. I just add to that that it's, you know, it, it still tends to be a less sophisticated inter internet market for users. And uh, many of the companies, the leading internet companies, actually employ a strategy that involves malware. Um, uh, you know, Lenovo, either malware or adware, um, Lenovo just had a very sort of high profile case uh, in which it was loading adware called Superfish uh, you know, onto uh, certain of its laptops. Um, that apparently was uh, causing them to be more susceptible to being hacked. Um, so this, you know, this remains an issue here. Um, Kaiser just caught some company that, you know, for example, we saw uh, trying to popularize its mobile browser. Um, we found that uh, the mobile browser was getting, at the time they wanted to popularize it, was getting bundled in with their mobile security software. So just wanted to upgrade to that mobile security software. And uh, and then one day uh, the pre-installed browser was not behaving so well, so a little clunky, not so smooth. Um, and so uh, the person we were talking with about this went ahead and tried the uh, mobile browser that came bundled with their security software, and it was incredibly smooth, worked very well. And then just to sort of uh, you know finish the test. They uninstalled that browser and they uninstalled, uninstalled the mobile security software and found that the original pre-installed browser, again, was working very smoothly. So with that as the backdrop, you know, it's very kind of difficult. There are a lot of companies that are actually employing these sort of strategies. Uh, and then in some cases, potentially, if not selling that information, it's using that information for partnerships. None of us know anything about Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. We all we talked about he originally put a question about Bitcoin on and we all said I don't know a thing, he doesn't know a thing, he doesn't know a thing. We all said we're not gonna, you know, talk yeah, about Bitcoin. Because I'm a, I'm an ignoramus about it now. Yeah, I noticed that in the West, most of the business of people they uh, quite a woke up about Bitcoin, they say some sorts of interesting things. And I, I, I it seems like uh, uh, people uh, I'm not aware that any of the Chinese uh, the top leader of the Baidu or JD that they say anything about Bitcoin. Look, what, what's, what are the causes? Uh, can you share any uh, insight in why people say silent about that? Um, and how are you? Uh, I mean, how aware of Bitcoin uh, for you uh, for you guys uh, personally and uh, as a company? Uh, that's my question. I mean, I think that we. Speaking from my own, or myself, uh, I think we've generally not talked about it because it generally hasn't been very relevant to us. Same here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's ma mainly because um, our senior leadership hasn't read enough Ayn Rand and hasn't indulged in as, as much sort of, um, you know, uh, libertarian fantasy. I'm, I'm and, and we don't have as much of an urgent need to transfer funds illegally outside of China. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I swear, I, I host this podcast. I invited this guy named Zenon Kaplan up to, to come on the show and to talk about Bitcoin. And he was brilliant. I encourage you to go listen to that show, through which I kind of sat going, I, I didn't really absorb too much. It's called Champing at the Bitcoin. <laughs> All right, I think this is it for our talk. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists.